Good afternoon, everyone. I am Molly Matram. I am the mental health liaison for the Ohio Department of Insurance. I just want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and taking time out of your busy schedules uh, for this training uh, on mental health and substance use disorder benefits. Um, just a little background on myself. Um, I have been with the department for four years, and in, during that time, I've worked on uh, our policy team, focusing on state and federal uh, mental health policy, and now I um, have moved into this mental health liaison role. Uh, and again, primarily my time here, the department has been focused on mental health parity, policy, outreach, and education efforts. Uh, and joining me today is Jana Jarrett, our Assistant Director of Consumer Affairs, and I will go ahead and let her introduce herself as well. Thanks, Molly. Hi, my name is Jana Jarrett. I am the Assistant Director of the Consumer Services Division, as Molly said. Um, I've been with the department 20, 21 years. Um, most of the time I've served in the Consumer Services Division in some capacity or another, and I have been in my current role um, for about uh, 10, 11 years now. Thanks, Molly. Thanks. And then later on in the training, um, we are joined, uh, she, she doesn't have to speak now, but uh, later on after we wrap up, Margaret Sleds at the Department of Labor will be joining us um, to highlight some information um, from, from DOL. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. I just want to highlight a couple of housekeeping items uh, first. Um, so this, our particular training should run 40 to 45 minutes. We are going to try and leave some time at the end for some questions. Uh, if you do have questions, we're just asking that you enter them into the chat box because you are, you all are muted and we will have somebody monitoring the chat box throughout the training to help administer those questions at the end. If you have specific questions um, about a particular um, case or patient or anything that might be uh, specific to your practice or your work, we would encourage you to reach out to our consumer services. Um, which I will certainly provide that information um, at the throughout this training. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today, the purpose of the training uh, is really just to provide some information and tools and resources to help uh, you, whether you are a behavioral health provider, billing personnel, uh, maybe you're a part of a utilization review team, or any other behavioral health professional, you know how to understand um, how to navigate mental health and substance use disorder insurance benefits. Um, whether it's for yourself, your practice, um, or the patients. So a lot of the information that we're going to be covering today is applicable to, to you as a provider, but also um, information to help you advocate for your patients and their families as well. I'm going to be covering a lot of information today, uh, so don't worry about capturing everything and taking notes. Um, everything that we cover throughout this training is actually going to be available on our online toolkit. Uh, which at the end of this training, I will be able, I will be walking through in a, in a live demonstration and identifying and pointing out where you can find the information that we will be covering. Um, so some of the information that we'll be covering today is I'm going to provide an overview of what our role is, what the Department of Insurance's role is in, in regulating these mental health insurance benefits. And then I'm going to give a very brief uh, highlight and broad overview of the state and federal laws, both the MAPIA law for mental health parity and the state law, um, again, and what our role is in regulating those benefits. And then Jana is going to um, take over and she's going to high highlight information about our consumer services division and how to file a consumer complaint and information about filing appeals and what that process looks like for both of those. Um, and then at the end, I will be covering um, some information on our toolkit um, and some updates from the department that I think are pertinent to, to you in the behavioral health community. Um, and like I mentioned, um, DOL will also be joining at the end um, to highlight some information from, from their regulatory standpoint. So let's dive in. Um, so simply, um, our mission here at the Department of Insurance is to provide consumer protection through education and fair vigilant regulation while promoting a stable and competitive environment for, insur for insurers. Um, so just to give you a broad overview of what that means, uh, we do that in a couple of ways. One, we know we regulate both the insurance companies and the plans that they sell. Uh, and then we enforce the laws related to insurance. All of these things really play into um, how we enforce and regulate mental health and substance use disorder benefits. I'm going to walk you through how and what that looks like. But to, just to give you a brief overview of what the, the health insurance market looks like, um, I wanted to share this infographic with you 
provide a visual for our role in regulating these insurance benefits. So the department oversees really only a portion of the health plans here in Ohio. So we have all the plans that are sold that you can purchase here in the state. We really oversee about roughly 14% of those plans. Um, so if you're looking at this chart, this pie chart, it generally breaks out, you know, what we have jurisdiction over and what we don't. So just to start off, those plans in yellow, that 23%, that roughly 23%, those are Medicaid plans, and those are going to be uh, overseen by the Ohio Department of Medicaid. That orange slice, that orange slice there is Medicare plans, and those are overseen by CMS. Um, then there are the self-insured plans, and that that's that green chunk there, which is the largest chunk of the pie. Um, Self-insured plans are, if you're not familiar, those are the plans when a company is large enough to provide benefits and pay for their employees' claims on their own without an insurance company. So for example, I obviously get my insurance through the state of Ohio, which has thousands of state employees. The state pays for my claims directly, making our plan a self-insured plan. Another way to think about it is, Think of like the largest companies in your area, in your area, um, there or here in the state, they're likely self-insuring. These particular plans are overseen by the Department of Labor, um, and that is their regulatory jurisdiction, which again, we, were, we will be lucky enough to have you all later on in this training to, to kind of highlight some of their um, services. And then there's the chunk of the uninsured, which you see in that like lighter brown color. Uh, we obviously don't regulate a population of the people who don't have insurance. Um, so then once you take away all those pieces of the pie, what's left are the ODI regulated plans, which are the large and small employer plans and individual plans, which is in that like dark brown color there. Those are the plans that we specifically regulate and oversee in the health insurance market. So what does it mean when I say we regulate and oversee these particular plans? Um, uh, we do so in a number of ways. So, you know, we review the products and plans insurers are selling to Ohioans for compliance with the mental health and substance use disorder laws uh, through our product regulation division. Um, so in order for a company to sell a product or a plan in Ohio, it must be approved by us first. And so we actually have staff on hand that will review the language within the plan to really understand the product and ensure that it's compliant with the applicable mental health laws, both the state and federal laws. We also monitor and investigate company practices through our market conduct division. Uh, we'll look at a number of things such as consumer complaints, um, company filings, trends in other states, uh, news articles, and determining when to investigate company practices for compliance with those laws. Um, I, I'm actually going to kick it over to Jana. She's going to kind of go a little bit more in depth on how, we, how each of our divisions work together to regulate and enforce these laws. Uh, thanks, Molly. Um, so what does regulation actually look like? Uh, I wanted to start by explaining some of the divisions within the department, as Molly mentioned, um, and she's already spoken about two of the divisions. You have the product regulation and actuarial services team that she mentioned uh, regarding reviewing product forms for compliance. They also review rate form filings. Um, so the rate filings that they review uh, are to determine if they are at the rates being charged are actuarially sound. Um, and again, she mentioned market conduct as well, uh, where they review company practices and look for violations or potential violations of insurance uh, regulations or policies. And that's done through um, complaint and, and data. That's Their reviews are driven through complaint and, and, and data that we receive. There are a few more divisions that make up the department as well. Uh, we have risk, our uh, risk assessment team. Uh, they verify the solvency of companies and they ensure that those that are in the market can handle the claims that are received. We have our fraud and enforcement division. Uh, they, they review allegations of agent misconduct and consumer fraud. And along with the market conduct division, those two divisions kind of act as our, the enforcement arm of the department. Uh, finally, we also have the, C uh, the consumer services team, which is my team. Um, we handle complaints received from the public, from consumers and providers. Uh, we review and analyze the situation against um, the, the situation or complaint that we receive against the insurance regulations and company po policies. And then we deem complaints confirmed or unconfirmed. Uh, the confirmed status would mean that we found an issue or potential violation of a law um, or that we found a uh, a company practice that is problematic. 
Uh, we are fact gatherers and we work with almost every other division um, that I mentioned. Uh, we work with product, the product regulation team to confirm that what they approved is being applied appropriately in practice. Uh, we work with fraud and enforcement when we have cases where an agent is named uh, as part of the complaint. Again, with market conduct, uh, a lot of some of their reviews, a lot of their reviews are complaint data driven. So we refer all confirmed, uh, confirmed complaint cases to them. Uh, risk assessment, we make them aware of any potential uh, financial issues a company may have. So if a company is slow on claims payments, that could essentially equal a cash flow problem. So we are always uh, in touch with them as well. In addition to those groups, we also have our licensing division, which handles the licensing of agents, uh, including, and they also deal with the continuing education of agents. And our legal division, which is, works with all of the divisions uh, internally, so we always need their um, assistance with situations involving any interpretation of laws or regulations. Um, and speaking of laws, I'm going to kick it back to Molly for more information on the mental health parity law. All right, thanks, Jenna. Um, so I'm just going to give a very brief and broad overview of the mental health parity law. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with mental health parity. It's a very complex law. So again, this is just a very high level overview. Um, so the mental health, uh, the Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act was signed into uh, signed into law in 2008. This is also known as the Mental Health Parity. Um, MAPIA, that might be another way that you've heard it referenced to. Uh, MAPIA generally requires health plans that provide coverage for mental health and substance use disorder benefits to provide coverage in the same or similar manner uh, for physical health benefits in the same plan. So, uh, for example, uh, financial requirements referred to what you might have heard be referred to as quantitative treatment limitations, QTLs. This would be considered co-pays, deductibles, um, co-insurance, these um, cannot be more stringent, cannot be covered or cannot be offered more stringently for mental health and substance use disorder benefits than they are for medical surgical benefits in the same benefit plan. Um, another example of how this is measured through parity are um, uh, uh, non-quantitative treatment limitations, also referred to as NQTLs. Uh, this could be considered uh, prior authorization, medical necessity, prescription tiers, uh, fail first policies, things that are non-quantitative within measuring. Again, these cannot be offered more stringently for mental health and substance use disorder benefits than they are for medical surgical benefits in that same plan. Um, something that the federal law does not set is a requirement for what specific benefits must be covered by a health plan. Um, so there's not any sort of list uh, provided by MAPIA that says this type, these types of benefits have to be covered. However, there are six benefit classifications where these benefits are going to be measured to ensure that they are offered similarly for both mental health and medical surgical. Those six benefit classifications are inpatient, out of network, uh, inpatient, in network, outpatient, out of network, outpatient, in network, emergency and prescription. And so those are the three or those are the six classifications that when measuring compliance um, and comparative analysis for, for both medical and surge, for both med, med surge and mental health and substance use, that's where they're measuring the benefits through. Um, initially, um, APIA really only applied to group health plans and then the Affordable Care Act expanded coverage to include individual plans um, as well. So generally, um, plans that are required to comply with MAPIA and mental health parity are self-funded and fully insured group plans, the large and small group plans, individual plans. Um, there are some exceptions, like certain grandfathered and transitional plans and certain retiree-only plans. Um, and something that we um, here at the department, especially through our consumer trainings uh, and through our resources and the, the information that we share, is that uh, really it's important to understand the type of plan a person has, um, to understand what benefits and services are, are available under those plans. The type of plan you have depends on that coverage. Um, so we really work with, um, with consumer groups and organizations to help uh, consumers identify tips that they can use to identify what type of insurance plan they have and where does that insurance come from. Um, 
the regulation from Rompia went into effect uh, January 13th, uh, 2014, where um, they, the federal government issued the final rules to implement the law. Um, the final rules is where you can kind of, you can read through and find the requirements of the federal law. Um, just to shifting over to the state law, um, Ohio Biologically Based Mental Illness Law was enacted in 2006. It requires the coverage and diagnosis and treatment for specific biologically based mental illnesses. Um, recently, um, I think it was December 2020, uh, Senate Bill 284 was amended to include language here in Ohio that would align the state and federal law or align the state law with the federal MAPIA law. The governor signed that into law um, on December 21st, yes, 2020. Um, so as I had earlier, there's there's a number of different agencies that are working together to regulate and enforce the PIA. Um, again, the department, what we're re what we're responsible for uh, is enforcing that MAPIA and BBMI state law uh, for those fully insured large and small group plans and individual plans. Um, again, this is just a very high level overview of both the state and federal law. We do have more information on our toolkit um, that links directly to the federal government's resources. Um, and other information on both of these laws if you're looking for a, a better understanding of, of both the state and federal law. But generally, a, a good rule of thumb to understand is that they work together to help achieve cover, coverage and parity among mental health and substance disorder benefits. Um, and so with that, um, I'm actually going to uh, switch it over to Jana, and she's going to cover complaints and appeals. Oh, thanks again, Molly. Um, now that we've gone through uh, the laws and kind of what kind of plans um, are affected by the laws, like I want to talk about what happens if you have a concern about a mental health claim or the or substance use disorder claim that um, that was handled or denied. Uh, there are two ways to address this situation. Uh, you can appeal the claim with the health plan, and you can also file a consumer complaint with our department. Uh, one thing that I want to discusses when is it appropriate to file an appeal versus a complaint. Uh, as most of you probably are aware, appeals have very specific timelines, so you would want to start there. We do not want you to miss out on your uh, uh, availability or ability to appeal um, because you filed a complaint and missed a timeline that, that is required. Also, there are situations where we as the department cannot get involved until an appeal has been filed. So if anything, you can file an simultaneously file an appeal and a complaint, but please, please do not substitute an appeal for a complaint. Uh, that being said, I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, cons filing consumer complaint and what that process looks like. A uh, complaint can be filed for various reasons. Uh, you can, if you're having in, any issues with your insurance company or agent, uh, you received a claim denial, or even if it, it's not a denial, if it's a reduced benefit, or you don't understand why a claim was was processed the way it was, you can reach out. We have dedicated staff on hand. We have tons of insurance experience, and um, we'll be able to assist you when you're filing your complaint. Uh, I'd like to take a look at what's actually needed for a complaint, the information uh, that's, that's required to file a complaint. Uh, obviously, the name of the company is key. That's our starting point, so it's imperative. Um, then we also need general information to um, identify the appropriate insurance company so that they can, in turn, uh, identify the, uh, the patient, the policy that's involved. Uh, for those things, we need the patient's name, the policy number, and any group number and group name if it is a group policy. We also need a detailed explanation of what occurred and with who. So we are looking for you to detail why you believe there's an issue with the way that the claim was handled and then provide any supporting documentation that you may have. Um, this can include emails, faxes, call notes, anything that documents your correspondence or your interactions with the company related to the claim or the situation in question. Um, once you obtain that information, let's talk about the general process that occurs. Uh, once you have all that information, a complaint can be filed in a number of ways. We have an online complaint form on our website. You can send us an email. You can even call in and provide uh, the information and file a complaint over the phone. When you file a complaint, what happens is that we will take the complaint that we receive and send it to the company, uh, to the health plan for an explanation. This means they get an actual copy of everything that we received as part of the complaint. 
So they will get any um, the detailed explanation that we're requesting from you. They will get that if you if you provide any of those documentations, the call notes, faxes, emails, anything like that. They will also get a copy of that. Uh, by law, they have 21 days to respond, but they can ask for extensions. Uh, and in, in mental health cases, uh, with mental health substance use cases, it can take a little bit longer just because they are so complex in some situations. So I just want to uh, make you aware of that. Our average turnaround time is about 40 days from start to finish. Um, but again, those can take a little bit longer depending on the complexity of the case. Uh, once we receive the response from the company, we'll review it to determine if any additional information is needed or if they have adequately addressed the concerns that were raised. If we have determined additional information is needed, we will go back to the company and request it. Um, and it's also, I want to note that, as I said earlier, we work very closely with uh, other internal divisions. So in addition to the information we received and what we may be going back and forth with the company about, uh, we will work with other divisions and, and have additional reviews internally as well based on the information that's received. Once we, we have made a determination that we have all the information, um, that they've you know, adequately addressed the concerns that were, were raised, we will review and analyze all the information and determine if any potential violations of law or regulation exist. Uh, we then draft our findings in a letter, which would go to the consumer provider, whoever filed the complaint. There are times we find the company acted lawfully, um, and we will spell that out in the letter. And there are times we find that a plan violated uh, the law or regulations in place. And in those situations, we would requ require the company to remedy the situation. Um, I'd like to take a look at the online complaint on our website so that you have an idea of what that looks like. Thanks, Molly. Um, so this is our website. This is the online complaint. As you can see, it's we hope it's pretty user friendly. It goes over all the information that, that I just described. So the contact information is for the person that's filing the complaint. So there's just the general information there so we can get in touch with you. Uh, from there, it's, uh, the insurance information again, critical um, so that we can contact the appropriate company. Uh, and there's, uh, as you can see, there's some options there that you can say you are the insured or you are a healthcare provider submitting it on behalf of a patient. Um, and then it gives you the opportunity to put the patient's name there. And then again, the, the imperative information of the insurance company, group number, policy number. Uh, you have to pick the type of coverage there. Um, go down a little bit further. If there's an agent involved, you would provide that information, probably won't apply in most of the situations here. Um, that would typically happen more on a consumer side. And then we get into the complaint description. So you can, the incident date or the, in this situation would be a date of service um, of the claim that you are having issues with. And then here's where you would be able to provide a description of what is happening, what happened, why you feel like it's it was handled incorrectly and then kind of put what your expected resolution is as well. Going on a little bit further, um, we have the complaint reasons. You pick up to three of these that you feel uh, apply in the situation. In this situation, typically it's claim handling and there are several options there, including mental health parity specifically. So you, you, you can pick up to three, you can pick one, um, whatever you feel is most appropriate. But finally, we get to supporting documentation. So right here is the option to be able to provide those those pieces that we that that I've mentioned. Um, any call notes, emails, anything that you have that would uh, support the situation that you're describing above. And then finally, I guess really finally is actually submitting the claim. So agreeing to the terms, submitting the complaint, and then that comes to us and we're able to um, begin the process from there. So that is the complaint form and the complaint process. Um, as Molly mentioned, we also wanna talk about the appeals process. So um, I wanna get into this piece as it's something that we really emphasize to consumers so they are aware that this is an option in cases where a claim or service was denied 
Um, and, and we just really want them to understand that this is their right uh, under the law. So as you are all aware, if you disagree with the decision that was made by a health plan regarding, regarding any claim denial reduction or reduction of benefits, which is also referred to as receiving an adverse benefit determination, there is a right to appeal that decision. Uh, if you're unsure about what an adverse be benefit determination it is, again, the definition is provided on the slide. But broadly, it's a decision by the health plan to deny benefit because they made a determination that the service is excluded, not covered, or limited under the plan, or that there, there's no eligibility to receive that benefit. Um, this can look like a couple of different things. Uh, benefit denial, prior authorization denial, reduction in the length of stay for an inpatient facility, or reduction in visits to a therapist. When a decision um, like that is received from a health plan, it can be appealed. So let's talk about how. Um, first thing, it is important to note that internal and external appeals must be um, initiated through a health plan. Um, when you file an appeal through the health plan, it's very similar to the process that we discussed for the complaint. You'll need to submit your reasoning for the appeal. You also want to include any supporting and documentation and anything else that is required by the company. Um, once you submit that information to the company, they'll review their initial decision and they will decide whether they're going to uphold or reverse their initial decision. That process usually takes 30 to 45 days. Uh, if an internal appeal is upheld, you can request an external review through the health plan. Again, external reviews have to go through the health plan, and there are two types, contractual and medical. Contractual reviews are handled by the department, and medical reviews are sent out to independent review organizations, as ODI does not have medical staff experts um, on our staff. Something that's important to note that is if your patient's life is in serious jeopardy or if they are unable to regain function if treatment is delayed, you can request an expedited review by phone to the health plan. All you have to do as an authorized representative is call the health plan um, and, and make that request. It is important to note that external reviews, whether contractual or medical, are uh, the decisions are binding. Uh, something that is also important to note about Complaints and appeals just generally is that they are really, really important to the work that we do. It helps us uh, understand what insurance companies may be doing in practice. Uh, we talked about earlier, the product regulation team reviews uh, product filings. And while they review the filing and the, and the words in, in the terms of the policy, complaints give us an idea of if those if those are translating as they are supposed to in the market. Um, and we would not know that without receiving some complaints uh, relative to what's happening. So it's very, very important to the work we do. Um, in addition, compliance is largely consumer driven. We look for trends. Uh, if we receive three complaints from different people regarding the same company and the same issue, we would look at that to see if there's a trend and then possibly, uh, and that possibly the insurance company isn't following uh, the laws that are in place. But, you know, even with three coming in, it doesn't always take that much, depending on what the situation is. We've had situations where one complaint prompted a deeper review of the situation. So I just encourage you that if you feel like a company wrongly denied a claim or service, or you received a, deuce, a reduced insurance payment to contact us as, you know, our, our insurance experts are uh, available and ready to assist. So I'm going to um, jump in real quick. I think Janet did a great job at kind of highlighting the importance and the reason why we really encourage uh, behavioral health providers to file complaints or appeals uh, when something comes up or a patient's experiencing a denial or reduced benefit or payment. Uh, I thought it would be helpful since we just recently released our annual report for um, highlighting our 2021 um, outreach and education efforts. But in those reports specific to mental health, we also we also uh, pulled the data for our consumer complaints and appeals numbers for that year. Uh, but just to give a broad overview and kind of add some, uh, some perspective to what we're saying, you know, a complaint may lead to a broader 
um, investigation or an overturn. Uh, from 2019 to 2021, um, the department received a total number of 42 consumer complaints uh, and 34 requests for external review. Um, and six of those consumer complaints have been reversed in the consumer in the consumer's favor, meaning um, these individuals filed complaints with us. As Jana mentioned, that her um, her team, her awesome team, uh, looked into those uh, complaints, did the investigations, reached out to the insurance companies, and they found that you know six of those uh, complaints needed to be reversed in the consumer's favor, and that the company was um, acting um, was not in compliance in some shape or form. Um, and then in, there was five external reviews reversed in the consumer's favor along that same line. So uh, this is just to provide a general overview of the last few years of some general data that we've had come through our consumer complaint and appeals. Um, we're really trying to, uh, you know, it's when we say we want to see more complaints in consumer uh, external reviews. We mean that in the sense of it helps us understand what's happening in practice, as Jana mentioned, um, and uh, really these these things show that compliance is also consumer consumer complaint driven. So I'm actually going to shift it over to Jana. She's going to kind of go a little bit more in depth on the 2021 numbers from our annual report, which I will certainly highlight where to access that report here in just a minute on our toolkit. Uh, thanks, Molly. Um, as you can see by this slide and what Molly just talked about, the the numbers that we've seen are are very low. Um, anecdotally, we hear that there are a lot of issues in this space in the market, um, and that is why we are, you know, as Molly just said, you know, kind of reiterating the importance of making sure that if these things are happening, that you that that the department is being made aware. Uh, and again, that is just typically handled like through the complaint process is is the way that that we get gather some of that that documentation and and that evidence. Um, I do think that, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen a decrease in health complaints overall. Uh, you know, there was a hold on elective procedures for a while. Um, so there's been a decrease in, in health insurance activity. Um, and however, we've all heard that the, and, and you guys are going to be most aware of the increase of the need on, in the mental health space um, since the, the, the pandemic has, has been happening. Again, looking at these numbers, uh, the complaints that we receive are not necessarily reflective of what's happening um, in the market from what from the anecdotal side of things that we're that we're hearing. Um, I do want to provide one example though of a situation that we incurred with a consumer uh, where we had a consumer that was uh, struggling with a company to get claims processed for uh, residential residential treatment and then subsequently outpatient therapy. Uh, they, when they first contacted, contacted us uh, regarding the residential treatment, they provided an allegation that the, that the utilization management guidelines um, that the company had in place were in violation of the mental health parity law. Uh, in the therapy sessions, uh, in that situation, they had submitted claims for two months um, and they didn't file the complaint. Uh, so the, the the, let's say the claims were November, December. They didn't file the complaint until the end of January, beginning of February, and the claims had not been processed at all. So they did file these two complaints separately due to the timing of, of the care that um, the patient was receiving. Uh, in both situations, we were able to assist and the claims were ultimately processed and paid according to the plan benefits. Um, this consumer has reached out to me individually and here recently thanking me for uh, our assistance in you know coming to me with other issues that they may have since we were able to get uh, the results that we were initially um, they also reported this was for their child and they reported that because of the care that the child received they are now flourishing they live in another state they're going to school and it's just you know those situations my team in particular, I mean, we're here to help people. And so to hear that on the back end, it just kind of reiterates for us uh, the the importance of what we do and how much we care uh, about making sure that people are able to access um, the benefits that, that they're entitled to. Um, and I just wanna, you know, again, kind of along that lines again, uh, the importance, discuss the importance of filing those complaints in, in, in external review appeals. 
Um, remember, like as providers, you all have the ability to uh, file complaints in uh, and appeals on behalf um, of your patients. So all of this information applies to all of you individually as consumers as well as uh, providers for your patients. Uh, and, you know, it gives us a very high, it gives us just the, a, a, we've said it a couple of times now, just understanding what's happening in the market on a high level and then being able to drill down as needed. Um, also from the complaint, filing the complaint, uh, the process of that, you know, we really are, again, looking to assist in, in every way possible. If you can get us those, the high level information, you know, that we discussed as far as just the general information of the insurance company, the claim, the patient, kind of what's happening and and what what ex expectation you have for an outcome. If you can get that to us, let us take on the process of going back and forth um, with the company for you so that you guys can focus on what you need to focus on um, outside of the administrative side of things. Um, we're to help you. We are here to help you. Um, we are here ultimately to help all Ohioans, uh, consumers and providers alike because all of us are affected by the insurance policy, by insurance policies in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we want to ensure that companies are honoring their contracts, providing the services they're supposed to, and, and complying the laws that that govern them. So, Molly. Yeah, thanks, Jana. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap up that end of the the training here. Um, and I'm going to highlight some of our toolkit and a couple of updates before I turn it over to the Department of Labor. So I just wanna, you've heard, you've heard me talk a lot about the online toolkit and what is that? I'm sure some of you have seen it before. Um, if you have not, um, I'm gonna show you how to access that um, here on our website. Again, our toolkit is uh, where we will find all of the information on our website uh, specific to mental health and substance use insurance substance use disorder insurance benefits. Um, you will always find uh, the toolkit available on our, our homepage for the, for the department. You click here, you'll always see it in that slider. This will take you directly to the toolkit. Um, we have a lot of information on here. Um, I would certainly encourage you to take some time, you know, after this training or in the coming days to, to hop on and familiarize yourself with some of the resources that we have available. But specific to you as providers in the behavioral health uh, field, uh, we have we have organized the information specific to you know consumers, providers, advocates. Um, and as you scroll down, uh, if you click on the information for providers tab, this is going to take you directly to um, a bunch of resources that we have put together that is specific to help you all in your role um, as a provider and advocating for yourself and your patients. Um, we have information, uh, for example, here. We have a handout that, you know, kind of summarizes everything that Jan and I have talked about today in, a, in one simple handout, um, something that we would encourage you to print out and share with your team and within your office and your practice, um, information about appeals um, and how to, how to file those. Um, there's other handouts available as well. Um, we, we go into detail about information that Janet has covered on complaints and appeals. Um, links to, to access the online complaint form, our consumer services information, um, and then also information on the side over here, accessing both uh, information for the mental health parity law, the Ohio law. We've included external resources to the other regulatory jurisdiction, the regulatory agencies, from of Labor, Medicaid, um, we have mental health and addiction services on there as well. Um, but just, you know, there's a lot of information on here. All the handouts are um, in PDF form and can be downloaded and shared. We have um, our employer toolkit on here as well. That's something we've recently released um, to help uh, employers across the state navigate mental health in the workplace and also how to navigate mental health insurance for their employees and what, what can they do to promote uh, mental health in general. So we've got some of that information. Um, and then just to highlight, um, if you're looking for something more specific, like our reports, uh, you just click, you know, for more information. If you're looking for our most recent report, mental health parity reports here, and we have listed all of our annual reports from the last couple of years. So um, if you're interested in what we've done over the last year, certainly click on uh, the 2022 report. It highlights all the work that we've done 
from outreach to education um, in conjunction with not only us as a department, but the, the Governor's Recovery Ohio Initiative and the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So like I said, please take some time to go through the, the toolkit. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, and a lot of the things that Jan and I covered today, uh, we've, it goes into more in depth on the toolkit as well. And then just to wrap this up, just wanted to provide a, a few updates from the department, I think that are pertinent to you as in the behavioral health community, uh, things to kind of keep an eye on uh, that will be coming from the department over the coming months. The first is um, our compliance filings. We are in our second year. Uh, the department implemented a new reporting requirement that uh, ensures file a specific set of information regarding compliance with the mental health parity law. Um, the new reporting tools significantly are improving the department's vis visibility into insurers' policies and procedures uh, and better enabling work with the industry to improve compliance in this specific area. Like I said, this is the second year the department is doing this and conducting these compliance uh, filing checklists. Um, so I wanted to make you guys aware of that. That's something on the enforcement side that we are focused on. Um, we are going to continue to offer these, these trainings going forward throughout the year. But also, if your practice, your organization is interested in a training for you and your staff, please reach out. We're always happy to offer these trainings going forward. Uh, we also offer a training for consumers as well. And that one's a little bit more focused on um, uh, how to identify your benefits, how to access those benefits, what to expect when you seek treatment from an insurance perspective. Um, Another update is we are in the process of um, co contracting with a actuarial firm to evaluate and compare uh, the level, level of coverage available for mental health and substance use disorder benefits um, in Medicaid plans and also private insurance, uh, private insurance, fully insured private insurance plans. Uh, the purpose of this study is really just to try and identify any gaps uh, in coverages and benefits uh, for individuals receiving these benefits on a Medicaid plan versus a, a fully insured private insurance plan. Uh, we're expecting this study to be completed at the no later than the end of June of this year. Um, and this is something we are looking forward to. And this really stemmed from a number of conversations that we've had with providers across the state uh, about trying to un uh, understand a little bit more about um, the mental health benefits um, across the, the different um, plans here in Ohio. And that just leads to we're going to continue to engage with providers, uh, you know, not only through the complaint and appeals process, as Jana talked about, but also um, if there's anything that, you know, you want to connect to the department on from a mental health parity perspective, we're happy to have those conversations, uh, especially, you know, that leads to trainings like this and the studies. Uh, but certainly keep an eye out for other uh, updates from the department over the coming months. We have a lot of work in this area uh, and we're really looking forward to some of the projects that we are working on.